Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD, is a neurodevelopmental disorder that begins in childhood. It involves signs and symptoms in one or both of two domains, inattention and hyperactivity. Children with ADHD are most often brought to clinical attention due to poor school performance, disruptive behavior, or both. We should note right off the bat that ADHD is a somewhat controversial disorder. This is because there are significant downsides to both underdiagnosis and overdiagnosis. On the one hand, children with untreated ADHD often have severe impairment in multiple areas of life as a direct consequence of this disorder, including low academic achievement, unstable peer relationships, and frequent run-ins with authority, some of which can have lasting consequences. For this reason, it seems cruel to deprive these individuals of the benefits of diagnosis, such as access to effective treatment. On the other hand, overdiagnosis of ADHD can also be a problem if it inappropriately stigmatizes a child's behavior, communicates that there's something wrong with them, or takes away their sense of self-efficacy if they begin to believe that they're unable to do things without medication. There's also a risk of medicalizing structural problems, such as a child growing up in poverty who has trouble paying attention in school due to hunger, for whom a diagnosis of ADHD is missing the real problem. Because the risks of both overdiagnosis and underdiagnosis are so profound, taking the time to gain a good understanding about how to evaluate the signs and symptoms of ADHD across the lifespan is absolutely essential. With this in mind, let's look at each of the core symptom domains of ADHD in more detail. First, inattention involves difficulties in maintaining focus on a particular thought or task. While most people have a train of thought that's able to stay on track for at least a few minutes at a time, In someone with ADHD, the train of thought is very easily derailed. This lack of ability to sustain attention leads to specific behaviors which are captured in the DSM-5 criteria for inattention in ADHD. You can remember these signs and symptoms using the mnemonic details off, which will remind you that patients with ADHD often struggle with details of their work being sloppy, are easily distracted, tend to engage in task avoidance, especially if the task requires continuous attention, appear to ignore instructions, frequently lose things, have trouble sustaining attention on the same task, lack personal organization, are forgetful when it comes to appointments or other responsibilities, and generally fail to finish tasks once they've started them. Of note, some people with ADHD can still show good attention for subjects or tasks that they find intrinsically interesting, suggesting that it is not impossible for someone with ADHD to focus, it's just much, much harder for them than for most people. Next, hyperactivity involves a high level of energy that makes it difficult to sit still or to keep from acting impulsively. The specific behaviors associated with hyperactivity and ADHD are captured in the mnemonic, He Riled Up, which will remind you that patients with ADHD are hyperactive, often fidgeting or squirming in their seat, energetic, with some describing them as acting as if driven by a motor, prone to running around or climbing even in situations where it's inappropriate, such as the middle of class, predisposed to interrupting or intruding upon others' conversations, loud, with difficulty doing activities quietly, effusive and talkative in their speech, intolerant of delays or waiting, unseated or up and about at times when they should stay in place, and inclined to prematurely answer questions even before the person is done asking them. These behaviors can be a problem in the patient's home life, but they tend to become particularly pronounced when the child is placed in structured environments like school, that rely upon a certain level of order and cooperation between the teacher and the students in class. Importantly, children with ADHD generally do not necessarily intend to be disruptive, but they find themselves unable to stop from acting impulsively. While the name Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder suggests that both inattention and hyperactivity are required for a diagnosis, the truth is that these two symptom domains do not always coexist in the same person. In fact, the most common form of ADHD involves inattention without hyperactivity. This brings up an important question. If these two symptom domains can occur in the absence of the other, why are they lumped together in the first place? There are two reasons. First, inattention and hyperactivity co-occur in the same person more often than would be predicted by chance. Second, both symptoms appear to respond to the same kinds of treatment. Together, these facts suggest a shared mechanism between inattention and hyperactivity. It's important to keep in mind that neither inattention nor hyperactivity are problematic in and of themselves. A certain level of inattention for tasks and subjects that we don't find interesting is completely normal, and hyperactivity is one of the perks of being a kid. However, when these traits become persistent and inflexible, 
ADHD can result. To use an example, it's not a problem to be loud and hyperactive in places that can accommodate this, like a theme park, but it can be disruptive in places that cannot, like a funeral. Another caveat when diagnosing ADHD is that it is a diagnosis of exclusion. This means that other medical, environmental, and social reasons for inattention and hyperactivity must be ruled out first. For example, a child who is stressed due to watching their parents fight every evening will likely have difficulty sleeping at night, leading to fatigue and trouble staying awake during class. This may manifest as inattention, but it should not be automatically assumed to be ADHD. While this is a rather obvious example, more subtle forms may exist as well. For example, ADHD is diagnosed more frequently in the youngest children in each class due to their earlier stage of cognitive development compared to their peers, illustrating how unconscious expectations play a large role in diagnosis as well. To lower the risk of diagnosing a child with a disorder when the problem is actually in the environment, the DSM requires that the signs of ADHD must be present in at least two different settings, such as at home and at school, before assigning the diagnosis. Putting this all together, you can use the mnemonic FIDGETY to remember the diagnostic criteria as listed in the DSM. The first half of the word will remind you that the core pattern of ADHD involves functionally impairing levels of either impulsivity and or distractibility. The second half of the word includes a few caveats to remember, that these symptoms must be greater than expected and not just the usual running around that is a completely normal part of growing up, that you need to exclude other possible causes such as mood or anxiety disorders, that these patterns must be observed in two or more settings such as at school and at home, And finally, that the patient must have been young at the first onset of the disorder, with signs and symptoms first appearing before the age of 12, if not even earlier. Next, let's look at the data behind ADHD, including who gets it, what happens once they have it, and what forms of treatment are effective. ADHD affects approximately 10% of children and 5% of adults, making it a common condition with a high base rate in the population. The inattentive subtype is the most common, accounting for over two-thirds of all cases, compared to the hyperactive subtype, which accounts for only around 10%. The combined subtype featuring both inattention and hyperactivity rounds out the remaining 20% of cases. Of note, ADHD patients may shift between different subtypes over time, such as a child with both hyperactivity and inattention who slowly becomes less behaviorally disinhibited but still struggles with maintaining focus. ADHD is one of the most heritable psychiatric conditions, with studies showing that genes account for about 75% of the variance between different people. However, environmental factors are also believed to play a large role, with in utero tobacco exposure, maternal stress, premature delivery, low birth weight, poverty, and, weirdly enough, growing up in an English-speaking household all being risk factors for ADHD. Cultural factors are likely involved as well, as rates of diagnosis vary from country to country and even from place to place within the same country. You'll remember from the why of the fidgety mnemonic that ADHD is a neurodevelopmental disorder that begins in childhood, with an age of onset around 3 to 8 years. The age of diagnosis varies by how impairing the symptoms are, as children who have severe symptoms are often diagnosed by the age of 5, while those who have only mild symptoms may not be diagnosed until age 8 or even after. ADHD is more common in males compared to females, with a gender ratio of over 2 to 1. Boys are more likely than girls to have the hyperactive subtype, which is reflected by the he in the he riled up mnemonic. However, this may make ADHD in females more likely to go unrecognized, as inattentive symptoms are often quieter than the disruptive behavior that characterizes the hyperactive subtype. Once symptoms appear, they are chronic and enduring, rather than episodic or fluctuating, which further helps to solidify ADHD status as a neurodevelopmental disorder. Roughly two-thirds of children diagnosed with ADHD continue to show signs of the condition as adults, either as a full-blown disorder or in a subsyndromal form that falls short of the diagnostic criteria but still remains impairing to some degree. However, this also means that up to one-third of children diagnosed with ADHD will show no signs of the disorder as adults, so the diagnosis should not be assumed to be lifelong in every case. Interestingly, the two domains of ADHD tend to follow different trajectories, with hyperactivity often being prominent during childhood, but then slowly decreasing with age, whereas inattention tends to remain at roughly the same level throughout life. Untreated ADHD can have profoundly impairing effects both during childhood and later in life. School children with ADHD tend to have worse educational outcomes, greater stress in family and peer relationships, 
and increased rates of other psychiatric disorders, including anxiety and depression, compared to those without the disorder. For cases of ADHD that persist into adulthood, there is an association with worse long-term outcomes in academic achievement, job performance, addictive behaviors, marital problems, unwanted pregnancies, and car accidents. Treatment of ADHD consists of therapy, medications, or both. The most commonly used therapies are in behavioral management and training, including CBT and family therapy. In general, behavioral therapies for ADHD are associated with medium effect sizes in the range of 0.6 to 0.7. Like most psychotherapies, the beneficial effects of treatment last even after the treatment is discontinued. Drug treatment of ADHD involves medications known as stimulants. Stimulants generally work by increasing the levels of the neurotransmitters dopamine and norepinephrine, which together help to improve both inattention and hyperactivity. The two most commonly used stimulants are methylphenidate, commonly known as Ritalin, and amphetamine salts, known as Adderall. As a class, stimulants are very effective, with very large effect sizes above 1.0. In fact, stimulants are among the most effective treatments for any psychiatric syndrome, with over 70% of people treated with these medications showing significant improvement. However, they are not without risk, including the possibility of growth restriction, although these children often catch up in height once the medication stopped, as well as appetite suppression, insomnia, and the potential for addiction and abuse at higher doses. Given these risks, behavioral therapy should generally be considered first, especially for those who are younger or only have mild symptoms. A variety of non-stimulant medications are available as well, such as atomoxetine, guanfacine, and clonidine. However, the effect size for these medications is lower than for stimulants, at around 0.5. This makes them comparable in efficacy to behavioral therapies, but without the benefit of long-lasting changes. Because of this, non-stimulants are generally used only in cases where medication is necessary, but a stimulant cannot be used, or to help increase the effect of a stimulant when additional improvement is needed. To wrap up, let's review what we've learned. ADHD is a neurodevelopmental disorder that begins in childhood and in many cases continues on into adulthood. Signs and symptoms of ADHD involve either inattention, as captured in the details off mnemonic, and or hyperactivity, as captured in the he riled up mnemonic. When diagnosing ADHD, use the fidgety mnemonic to remember the core pattern of symptoms as well as important conditions to exclude. While symptoms of ADHD can be incredibly impairing, effective treatments are available, including both behavioral therapy and medications. The availability of treatment underscores the need to carefully screen for the condition, as untreated ADHD is associated with poor outcomes in various areas of life. However, there are also significant downsides to diagnosing someone with ADHD, including a risk of overtreatment and stigma. For that reason, you should always rule out other factors that can mimic ADHD. Provided that these conditions are met, however, working with someone who has ADHD can be a very gratifying experience, as treatment often leads to improvements in functioning that are both immediate and dramatic. And that's it. Thanks for watching. I hope this video helped you to understand how to diagnose ADHD, as well as the pros and cons of doing so. If you'd like to learn more, consider picking up my book, Memorable Psychiatry, which dives deeper into the differential diagnosis of ADHD, along with a bunch of practice questions to help solidify your knowledge. Good luck in your studies.